some people might think, well, wait a minute, warmer water, is, isn't that better? I mean, it's nicer to go in the water. We're only talking a little bit, a few tenths, maybe a couple of degrees. What, why is that such a big deal? That has big, big implications for you know, for the, for the weather that we experience and a serious impact on the animals uh, that are living there. Well, you may have seen headlines recently about sort of this alarming spike in ocean temperatures. We want to talk about what's causing it and why you should care. Let's talk about it with Dr. Andrew Pershing of Climate Central. Let's get to it and talk about what's happening right now. First of all, what El Nino is and uh, what's happening uh, out in the Pacific Ocean and in that basin that it matters so much for the rest of us. So, I mean, El Nino is one of the most impactful kind of climate and weather phenomena that we have on our planet. So the, the Pacific Ocean right along the equator is one of these special places where as the winds blow across the equator, they tend to like push the water to the sides and it tries to bring cold water up. So I like to think of it as almost like the planet's air conditioner. And what happens during, a, during an El Nino event is that we basically are turning the thermostat up. So we get warm water that pools, uh, that, sh that basically is sloshing uh, through the Pacific uh, and building up on the, on the eastern side, so around the Galapagos, off of Ecuador. And that amount of heat, right? Water just stores a tremendous amount of heat. That amount of heat relocating to the east uh, along the equator there just kind of can tweaks the weather patterns all over the world. Um, and so it's really an impactful pattern. The other thing that it does is because it's the Earth's air conditioner is, and we're turning up the thermostat, is that it, global temperatures are going to start popping. So we're going to start to see us hitting, you know, record global average temperatures, uh, you know, starting in the next few months, uh, and then next year is likely to, to, to take the cake. Yeah, you know, it's one of those questions that I get asked all the time, why should I worry about changes in the water over the Pacific Ocean? How is that possible to have these global scale connections and teleconnections, we call them in meteorology? And, you know, one of the things that I looked at a lot when I was in graduate school was sort of how the patterns of uh, heating in the tropics, the thunderstorm complexes that not over a day or over a week, but over the course of several months, how those begin to impact the jet stream worldwide. And it's a remarkable, that connection, that you relocate patterns of thunderstorms over the longer term, you know, so going from month to month, and how that really matters a lot for what the jet stream looks like, let's say, over North America and, by extension, over the nearby Caribbean and the Atlantic. So it has so many repercussions for North American patterns of weather, but also for hurricane season as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, the you're going to be able to explain this to your viewers probably better than I can. But, you know, the you know, one of the key ingredients that you need to form a hurricane is you need to have very still air, right? Not a lot of wind shear uh, so that the storms you get this kind of convection that will build all the way up. And during a, during El Nino, you tend to have more wind shear in that Caribbean storm formation region. And so it it, it suppresses the generally the number of hurricanes that are uh, that are able to form. So you tend to have lower. So the, my understanding is that the forecast this year for, you know, an average to slightly below average season, which contrasts with the high, you know, the high, um, you know, the above average seasons of the last few years when we were in the La Nina or the cool period, which tends to boost, uh, give a boost to hurricanes. So a lot of times when we think of El Nino and the increase in water temperatures in the Pacific Ocean that accompany it, some people might think, well, wait a minute, warmer water, is, isn't that better? I mean, it's nicer to go in the water. We're only talking a little bit, a few tenths, maybe a couple of degrees. What, why is that such a big deal? I mean, what kind of uh, consequences are we talking about atmospherically worldwide? Yeah, so if you if you look around the world, um, ocean temperatures at the surface set uh, you know set a record. They, they really spiked uh, in kind of a surprising way uh, in the last month or so, uh, and so we see a lot of places all over the world where water temperatures are much much warmer than we would expect, and that has you know that has big big implications for 
you know, for the for the weather that we experience, it makes uh, things like atmospheric rivers hold more water and so can, you know, make them more powerful. But it, you know, it has a, a serious impact on the animals uh, that are living there. So, you know, I have a, I have a right whale above me. You know, these guys are, are a North Atlantic species. They're very, like, they, they feed on cold water organisms. When the Northwest Atlantic warms up, and it's been very, very warm now for about a decade, it disrupts the feeding patterns for these animals. They produce fewer babies. Uh, and so you just see a lot of challenges. So, you know, salmon we're worried about on the West Coast. Uh, right now, that's, there's a very strong climate story to salmon. Cod, we're worried about in the Gulf of Maine and in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, there's a very strong climate signal there. And then, you know, coral are this sort of perpetual, uh, uh, you know, signal of how much we've changed this planet, right? Seeing coral bleaching appear in the Great Barrier Reef or in the Caribbean, that's also often something that pops during El Nino. Yeah, and, you know, the amount of uh, heat content in the ocean as well uh, changes, and that can change the potential intensity of tropical cyclones, of course, in the Pacific Basin. But, you know, also more thinking more globally, you know, when you increase the water temperatures, you're going to increase evaporation rate. So there's going to be a lot more water vapor coming into the atmosphere, which can have profound implications for the patterns of drought and, in particular, in flooding. Uh, around the world. So there's a whole lot of things that just changing what seems like a relatively benign exercise, right? Just changing the water temperature a little bit can get you in a lot of trouble very quickly. I, yeah. And I, you know, I think the fact that we talk about ocean heat content in terms of, I, I forget the units, they're like, you know, terra, peta, whatever joules, right? We talk about it in joules and units of energy. And that's really what the ocean is doing is it's, it's a battery. It's storing a whole bunch of energy in the form of heat and where and how and how much it releases back to the atmosphere has just a huge effect on the weather patterns all over the world. Yep. Well, indeed, that's the case. Uh, Dr. Andrew Pershing of Climate Central, thank you so much for joining us once again. And uh, we'll just, uh, I guess, take it all in stride as the upcoming uh, hurricane season and beyond uh, we deal with the El Nino and its consequences.